Well, my name is Alistair Fettis Leslie. The middle name of Fettis comes from my father's mother's side. I was born the middle one of three sons in a gardener's cottage on a large estate some eight miles north of Glasgow. My mother came from south-east London and married my father, who was of Scottish origin. When I was two years old, my father moved to another gardening, horticultural job in the island of Butte, Rothsey to be exact, which was a large spa hotel in those days. The gentry of the wealthy people of Glasgow used it as a recuperation area, a facility at that time. My earliest recollections go to 1928. I would be four years old and I can just vaguely remember sitting on the wall, my father coming over the garden, lifting me off. The next move was, at the age of four, he had another post on an estate in Lanarkshire, between Glasgow and Edinburgh. This also had a tied cottage to it as part and parcel of the job. This cottage had considerable land and woods behind it, and to a large extent we were self-supporting, which was rather essential because we were in the de deepest part of the Depression in 1929-30, and uh, wage, his wage at that time was two pounds a week. <laughs> However, we survived. <laughs> yes. And in 1940, in 1934, my father was showing serious signs of mental illness. He fought in France in the First World War. Yes. In transport, mainly using horses, and from there he went to Iraq, which in those days was called Mesopotamia. Yes. And from there he was moved to Burma and told me tales of rafts being built to carry a number of horses down the Irrawaddy River. Yes. <laughs> now, he was sacked from that job because of his illness. My father had a brother and a sister. Yes. Rather, he had two sisters. And it's the second sister that I would emphasise because she was illegitimate. Yes. And there's great mystery as to her parent in origin other than my grandmother, obviously. Yes. She came to the rescue. We had to move to a place near Danoon on the River Clyde estuary, and that lasted a few months. Then we had to move to a small mining town in Lanarkshire because my illegitimate aunt provided funds to purchase a small shop yes. on this estate where our main customers were miners, most of them unemployed at that time, by the way. Yes. So bringing us up was handed over to my mother, which she did valiantly, really. Yes. Well, one day 
I was in the shop. We had a little room at the back, and then we had a little toilet and a wash place. And we, we tended to live in there because we were up the road in one room, all five of us. Yes. So, so we, we tended to gravitate to the shop for daily. We only went back to this room for sleeping at night. One day, a car drew up, and uh, two men and a policeman, that was three, came in. And I was looking through a little hole in the wall and took my father away. Two doctors, they were. They were certified. He was 41 years of age. Mm. To come to a large Victorian style of, as they had in those days, uh, yes. hospitals. And he lived there till the day he died. Age 90, 73. So quite a long time that he was in hospital then. For, 30 yes. odd years. I was the only one in the family that kept in touch with him. However, uh, I decided my mother was having quite a hard time coping with us. To my knowledge, she got nothing from the state. In fact, the state, at one stage, wanted to charge her some fee to keep my father in the in the home, in the hospital. Which we think about it nowadays is rather ludicrous, isn't it? Yes. I went to school along with my other two brothers. And while we were in a small mining village, nevertheless we had a very good education, both primary and especially in secondary. My older brother, two years ahead of me, was always the top of the class and the top of the school. He was very yes. clever. My younger brother scratched along behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you heard, but one of the last great exhibitions was held called the Empire Exhibition, was yes. held in Bella Houston Park in Glasgow. Yes. So I got access to this park and all these wonderful pavilions. Yes. And one particular pavilion dedicated to the Royal Air Force. Mm. So I went in this building, nearly hit my head on the hawker heart that was hung up in the ceiling. <laughs> Booklets. Oh, it sounds promising. So I took one of these booklets away and ex it explained exactly what was available on an apprenticeship, yes. providing you passed an exam. Mm -hmm. My mother, I think, was rather pleased <laughs> that I was heading in this direction. <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one less from the nest. Yes. Anyway, <clears throat> the curriculum was such that I didn't quite meet the parameters and my headmaster decided to move me up to the next grade to do the science necessary, which is what happened. Yes. Sat the exam, passed eventually, and was invited to join the Royal Air Force. Sign up for fifth, three years apprenticeship, followed by 18 years service. Wow. <laughs> my mother signed me up. I said I'll get to my own back on. <laughs> on her at some time. She was eager to get rid of you by yes. the size of things. <laughs> so, <laughs> I eventually was given a date, go down to Halton, travel down to London, first time ever. One of my uncles met me, saw me, take me overnight and put me on the train to Wendover. Yes. A big lorry took us up to Halton and uh, they sorted you out as to what you wanted to do. By the way, there were 1,750 lads applied for jobs, and there was only 500 vacancies. 
Wow. I was about 460, I think. Yes. However, with the advent of the war, every single one was taken in. I bet, yes. I mean, just to... You were how old at this time? I joined at 15 years and four months. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's quite young, isn't it? The ages were between 15 and 17 and a half. Mm. Yeah. I would say the average age was obviously 16. Yes, yeah. yes. So you arrive at Halton. Arrive at Halton, give the usual checks, and that's when they discovered that I had quite serious colour uh, deficiency. Yes. I had applied to be electric and or wireless. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You call it defective. You might put the blue wire when the red one's going. <laughs> So that finished that. So the alternative was to be an instrument maker or instrument repair, whatever you want to call it. Yes. I had hoped that this was the way to being air crew. Mm. But as soon as I got my classification as being colour defective, right across the top of my records were written unfit for flying, so that washed that out of the picture completely. Mm. Mm. Settled to be an instrument maker, and the training was carried out at Cranwell at that time for electrical, wireless and uh, instruments. So we went up to Cranwell, and... Uh, by that time, the war had been on about a fortnight, because it was just ten days before the war when I joined. Yes. The Cranwell was made up of largely a cadet training ground of. A, Perhaps you've heard of Lord Trenchard. Yes. Lord Trenchard created the Royal Air Force in 1918. Hmm. And he created this college at Cranwell to train officer pilots. But he realised that with the technology of the aircraft, he needed airmen of a higher capability. Yes. And that's why he set these exams such that he got the right level of person. That was the idea. That's why the apprentice training scheme was brought in at that time. That started in 19... I think it was 1920. Hmm. So I started training there. And a few months later, it was decided to bring all that part of the training back to Halton. Yes. So we moved on block. But just before we went, we had to uh, one day move all our beds together, push them all together. Why was that? Well, it released one block and possibly two blocks for airmen coming back from France through Dunkirk. Yes. And that's when I saw all these poor devils depressed, Worn out. Yes. Gave us some indication as to what went on in that part of, early part of the war. Otherwise, at that time, it wasn't really touching Britain, Britain to any degree. This was up till 1940, about June 1940. Yes, yes, indeed. Settled in at Halton to finish my training, which as I said, the beginning was a three-year course. They decided to cut it down to a year and nine months. But the curriculum had to stay the same. <laughs> Social life went out the door. Mm. You had to get to and get your studying done, or else you were off the course. And... 
During that time, my mother coming from Greenwich, she was one of 16 children. Wow. <laughs> and most of them had settled round in South East London, Woolwich, Greenwich, Eltham, Sidcup, all those places. Excuse me. That's OK. So I took the opportunity whenever I had a day leave or two days leave to go and visit them, which is what I did quite regularly. Mm. And one weekend I was at an aunt and uncle having lunch when the sirens went off. So we were told to decamp to the foot of the garden and into an Anderson shelter. Some people may not know what an undershelf is, but it was a tin contraption on which she piled sods of earth. <laughs> and they were quite effective as far as I know. Mm. And we were in this, heard the drones coming from above, and I looked up, I thought, there are lots of blackbirds up there. It was the first massed raid on London by the Germans. Thousands of Junkers bombers coming over. They passed over us, and then we started hearing the, the bangs right on the docks in London. The first major raid carried out in Great Britain. Yes. After that, it continued, obviously, for some, <clears throat> some years. It didn't start easing off until D-Day, really. And then, of course, they had other weapons, such as the V-1 and the V-2. Yes. When my course finished, we had to do our written exam and the practical exam. I, I had... My job on the practical exam was to make a Maltese cross. <laughs> you don't kick them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interlacing thing like that. I don't know if you've ever seen a Maltese cross. And it must spin, so you've got to get it very accurate. Yes. Anyway, of my entry, there was 126 boys studying to be instrument makers. And six of us came out at the top, and I was one of them. And we got the top aircraft rank immediately. Then there was two before that, below that aircraft one, one aircraft one, two. I was a leading aircraft one. I had a propeller. Yeah. Right. Finish your exams. Dispatch us all to squadrons to do some work. And I was sent to the very north of Scotland. Probably somebody saw I was Scottish, so we'll send them up there. <laughs> it was a blessing, really. And uh, the little unit I was on was on the Cromarty Firth. And its main purpose was to train air gunners and bomb aimers. Lots of empty land north of there. You could go and drop your bombs on marshes and all sorts. And, uh, the air gunners, we had small planes like Lysanders that pulled drogues and mm -hmm. they could fire away at that. So we had 26, uh, sorry, 60 mm -hmm. people coming in every few weeks to train in those two occupations. The sad part was that after their training, they all went to Bomber Command. They were voracious for people to... because they were building Lancasters and all sorts at a terrific yes. rate, mostly here in, in Manchester, of course. Yes, yes, indeed. Avro. <laughs> and uh, as we know now, 50% of those lads died within something within days, weeks, months. Mm, mm. Huge loss. I 
I can't say other than that I had a very enjoyable time in the north of Scotland at that unit. Got to know all the local population extremely well. Get invited into tea here and there. Very nice. Rationing, they'd never heard of it. <laughs> they didn't exist. And uh, our dental officer, the two stripes, decided to approach the Air Ministry and we created the very first pipe band in the Royal Air Force. Really? <laughs> we got permission to wear the Seaforth Highlanders kilt. Mm -hmm. And we were all equipped. I learned to play the bagpipes. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yeah. So I joined the band and off we went. We used to go around all the little towns. You may have heard that we held things in the war of wings for victory. You yes, brought your yes. old saucepans along and whatever yeah. you could afford to go and build Spitfires and etc. We had a great time doing this. I see the Air Force pipe bands now. Oh, they're full of gold leafless and all sorts. I just I can't recognise them. But that was the origin. That was the first one really? that was created. <clears throat> anyway, those days came to a halt after VD, V Day. Mm -hmm. Somebody down south thought, we'll sort that lot out. So postings came through and I was sent to join a unit consisting of officers and senior non-commissioned officers to learn the ropes that was occupied by our civilians normally, which was uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft checks, it was really. I've forgotten the name now. It'll come to me in a moment. Mm -hmm. AID, that's it. Aeronautical Inspection Department. <laughs> and they were all civilians. Yes. But it was decided that civilians would not go overseas. So the idea was this lot of officers and NCOs, they're going overseas, we'll put them somewhere. So mm -hmm. I went on courses. I went to about four or five factories, spending a fortnight in each. Went to the English Steel Corporation in Sheffield and mm -hmm. Birmingham, Bristol especially. And uh, eventually we were all brought together at Blackpool, civilian houses there on the South Shore. Yes. What a whale of a time. I thought, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the day of reckoning came. And uh, we were all marched to the station and finished up at the docks, Liverpool docks, and off we went on a troop ship. We were supposed to have gone, but it broke down. We got in the middle of the River Mersey and broke down. So we went back in dock for a few days. And in that time, we had missed the convoy assembling in Liverpool Bay. However, when we did get out there eventually, we had our own destroyer to escort us. And at that time, you didn't just go around and into Gibraltar, you went away into the Atlantic, then came in. Yes. So the submarine activity was quite active at that. It's still going on very strongly. Although once you're in the Med, there wasn't any ac a submarine activity that I know of. So we'd destroy it. The destroyer went off and left us, and we yes. ploughed on through the bed. Oh, as we were getting equipped to go abroad, the interesting thing was that the landladies could always tell you whether you were going to Iceland or India, you know. They knew first. They knew first. <laughs> yes. And we were all issued with with helmets, <laughs> which were still issued in... The Zulu Wars. And the minute you got to your station in your country you were going to, the first thing they did was take them off and put bush hats on. 
So that was an episode that phased out then. Yes. We, the the sh troop ship was packed with mainly army, quite a large contingent of the air force, and about two or three hundred girl wrens who were secreted away at the front of the ship, keep them out of harm's way. The food was abominable. It was a, almost a riot as we passed through Gibraltar. It was just slops. So there was a quite a serious meeting to place with the captain, and he said, as soon as we get to Malta, we'll get some better supplies, which is what they did. And again, Port said as well, we did the same. So we managed to struggle through and we've down the Red Sea, across the Ceylon. We got all these girls off then, sent them on their way. Then we went up to Bombay. Had a few weeks there. Some lovely places to swim north of Bombay. We had some lovely outings. We always made the best of it, mm. no matter what the circumstances were. Mm. Anyway, I was posted to Calcutta. So it was six days on the train to get there, stopping and starting. When I arrived, I was allocated two factories, quite near to where we were billeted, under contracts to repair instruments. Meantime, most of those troops went a hundred miles north and they suffered some terrible casualties. Hmm. Felt a bit guilty looking back on that now. There we were in this city, living it up really, playing tennis on the mile down, going to the, a famous restaurant in Chowry called Purpose. Everybody went there. Yes. The cinema was called the electric cinema, and it was the only one that had air conditioning. Anyway, one day I was out, actually I was playing tennis. It's terrible to say that when these lads were up there giving their lives away. However, a colleague called me over and said, have you had the news? I said, no, the war's over. I said, Yes, he said, the Americans have dropped the atomic bomb twice on two cities. It's over, finished. This was August yes. 1945. Yes. Well, these clerks who work in the background deciding who goes where and what thought, we'll sort this lot out. <laughs> on the train, northwest frontier. <laughs> Oh, no. So now I'm into peacetime, you see. Yes. And uh, went to a small unit in the foothills of the Pimbley. But I don't know why we were there or what we did. But anyway, we made the best of it, as usual. We used to sit in a circle with a big tin drum full of beer and tell stories. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, that came to an end, obviously, it could continue. We had a huge maintenance depot in Lahore sent there. So I went down there to take charge of this depot and then I got promoted to staff sergeant from that point. And I spent two years in Lahore, all post-war now. Yes. I, they had a, all the people going through at that time were going home to, because they'd signed up for the war. And it left me feeling, oh, all my colleagues were going, you see. But they had a system there for the army and the air force that you could go on leave to the UK if your name came out of a hat, one in 10,000. Out it came. 
six weeks to get back to the UK, a month's leave, six weeks to get back. Golly. No fly. So he didn't there, fly right. anywhere, even though you were in the Air Force. Yeah. So I came back and uh, had my six weeks. A colleague of mine got I knew in Scotland was getting married. I went up to Inverness and I played the wives at his wedding. And I think it's about then that I began to become acquainted with Manchester. Why and how? My older brother, by, by the way, all three of us were in the Royal Air Force. Really? Yes. But my older brother, he always wanted to be a crew, and whatever he did, he couldn't get beyond being the lowest rank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, he was posted to India while I was up here, and he was posted to Madras, waiting to go for Singapore's D-Day. It was all getting yes. built up. Anyway, the bomb finished there. He'd caught a cold, his face jo jammed, got jammed with sleeping under his lorry, apparently. And uh, for recuperation, they said, you could go away for three weeks. Where would you like to go? I said, well, be brothers. Oh, all right, you can go a thousand miles. <laughs> <laughs> he came up and uh, he said, I said, listen, I, I'm running the sergeant's mess here. You're a sergeant, and don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this went on for a while and one night, by the way, we had fires in, up there at that time in the winter. Yes, it was yes. cold enough for a fire. We sat around the fire and the senior non-commissioned officer was sat there and Roy Hank, Hank he drank a beer too much and his tongue began to get loose. Oh dear. So I had a job quite getting him out of there at the time. They brewed beer up in that area called Murray, M-U-R-E-E, -E, and <laughs> it had a kick, like a mule. <laughs> Eventually, he went home to be demobbed. When he came back, he'd been promised a, a place at Manchester University. Of course, by that time, he was... Uh, what they call a aged pupil, is it? Or mature student, a mature whatever. Mature pupil, yeah. that's yes. the word, yes. Mm -hmm. So he started... Oh, he came home to get married as well. Yes. And he married a lady called Erika, and her surname was Throlich. And she always said she was Swiss, and I had my doubts. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lake in the south of Switzerland. One side's Switzerland, the other side's is uh, Germany. Yes. She worked as an ATS girl on the Akak guns. And one of Roy's jobs before he was sent to India in the Air Force, was to liaise with some aircraft that came over and allowed the, gun, the gunners to compute their equipment, such as it was then. And that's how he met her, mm -hmm. a place called Clyde Bank, right. near Glasgow. He kept in touch and decided he was going to get married, so he came back, got married. I couldn't attend it, obviously, because I was st still in India, you see. And, uh, when I did come back, my mother was... When she, eventually she had to sell this little shop in Lanarkshire because the business fell away. She joined the fire service. I've got photos of her in her uniform. Yes. Joined the fire service. She was in everything. She came up for the wedding, and Erica's parents lived in Macclesfield. And uh, 
She liked it so much, she says, I'm going to stay here. I don't know where she'd been. She'd been all over the place. Because mm -hmm. she was in Naffy as well, you know, in Oxfordshire. So when I did come home on this six weeks leave later that year, that was my focal point, Macclesfield. Only been 20 or 21, I was a right gad about <laughs> into Manchester. That's how I came to make my acquaintance of Manchester, you see. Yes, yes. So there was a club which was for the forces underneath Boots Chemists down at the bottom of Market Street. Mm -hmm. And there was a lovely restaurant in there, dancing. Oh, this is great. I'm off. <laughs> so this, oh, by the way, on occasions, the nurses from the local hospitals were allowed in to the dance. That's where I met. <laughs> yes. And uh, we were able, they were starved, you know, the, the rationing was dreadful then. They were absolutely starved. Could you, could you get me to the restaurant? Yeah. Could you get me clothing? <laughs> <laughs> All that. Anyway. This was, uh, I got to, got to know her then. And this was after the war? Not the whole of this is, you see, yes. most of my yes. tales are after the war. Yes, yes. Really, when I look back now. And I've got hardly a photograph of taken during the war. No, no. Most of them are subsequent to that. Mm. So... Oh, I, I'd gone, I hadn't, I hadn't met Chris's mum by that time. I came back. Oh, I was in India the night that Jinnah and what's his name came on the radio and said at the stroke of midnight, Pakistan's created. Mm. It was a very... Uh, It was a very, well, what was the name? Pandit Nehru, that's who. That's right, yeah. yes. He came on the radio and said, oh, very, I can hear him now at the stroke of midnight, the British Raj will be no more. Mm. And he was absolutely right. <laughs> so within a few weeks, we were all ordered out. Get down to a troop ship the best way you can. Yes. So down tools and off. And when I left the Lahore station to go down to Bob Bay, about four or five weeks later, two trains came in. <coughs> One was full of Pakistani. The other was full of Hindus. Set about each other and oh, almost slaughtered the lot. Well, this went on throughout. That area at mm. that time, what was it, about a million, one and a quarter killed in that way. So eventually I got back home. Now, originally I said that I joined up for 15, uh, three years training and 18, 18 years, years service. Yes. So I was on a contract. So I was still serving on. Came back for two, three weeks leave and immediately told to report to a, a station near Cambridge. Next day, trucked out to Germany via, I think, went on Hook on Holland across to Belgium, mm -hmm. hey, to Holland and through to uh, past Hamburg to a place called, uh, oh dear, It'll get me in a moment, I'll remember. Mm -hmm. And the squadron that I was attached to was the very first squadron to operate jet engines, the Meteor. Yes. And they talk of Cold Wars now, but there was 
the most terrible Cold War going on at that time, and then just uh, shortly after the war, two years, because Stalin had decided he'd only got a quarter of Europe divided up when they carved up. So mm. He wanted a bit more. He was made, shall we say, very awkward. And our job was to patrol up and down the line there. Lübeck's the name of the place, mm -hmm. near Hamburg. That was 1947, late 47. Yes. We left India in August 47. While there, I took the opportunity of having a trip into Hamburg. Mile after mile of huge piles of rubble, still smoking. It's, but there was one great big building in the middle, and it was the town hall. I don't know if you know, they call the town hall in Germany. It's called a Rathaus. Oh, yes. <clears throat> and we had German bands busy playing away in order to earn a crust. Food galore. What a wonderful time there mm. on these little trips. At that time, I think they were getting quite near a place called Travimundi where they were beginning to build the site for the V2 rocket, you know. That was yes. the centre of it. Anyway, after a while they decided changed the squadron round and brought it home. And they sent me to uh, near Doncaster on a, a Lancaster squadron. That was the first time I flew in a Lancaster there. Mm -hmm. While I was there, my mother was in Macclesfield. I was courting Chris's <laughs> mum. <laughs> Coming backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And uh, then we decided to get married. So we're married in Leeds. Uh, had our honeymoon in a place called Lynmouth, you know, yeah, in Devon. North Devon, yes. And then I was posted to London, to the RAF headquarters, just off top of Aldwych there. And I was on a job that I've never really fathomed yet, to do with statistics. <laughs> You're allowed to go in civilian clothes. I was in a big flat opposite Lord's Cricket Ground. Oh, yes. Again, the life of Riley. I feel, feel ashamed when I look back now. <laughs> <laughs> so this went on for a while. Oh, by by being married, you, you, the ability of getting quarters was not existent then. Mm. So eventually, I, we got a little apartment or part of an apartment, South East London near Crystal Palace. Mm -hmm. This job in civilian clothes, living it up, came to an end, shipped abroad again. This time they put us in Dakotas and flew us direct to Germany, to Schleswig-Holstein. When we got there, we had a whole load of... Uh, uh, the Hercules bombers? I've forgotten it. I'll get the name in a minute. Converted. Mm -hmm. What were they carrying? Coal. Why were they carrying coal? When they carved Germany up, they handed certain parts to the four, hmm. the Russians, the French, the Americans and ourselves. And they did the same in Berlin. Mm. into four pieces. But surrounding Berlin was the Russian part. So 
Stalin had got his grips. <laughs> he decided yes. to starve the, the, Ber the whole of Berlin out. He wouldn't allow any air, any troops, any rail or road transport. But he couldn't stop the flying. That's the reason for the coal. We flew the coal into Berlin. When we had to go and repair the instruments, we used to come out as if we'd been down the mine <laughs> with all the dust. <laughs> So, by that time, I'd been 10 years in the Air Force. Yes. All my colleagues that I knew had been demobbed. I didn't think it was going anywhere, so I said, can I break my contract? You could, under the, oh, by the way, at the same time, my younger brother, who was a pilot, crashed near the Zambezi Falls. Uh, he was coming home for my wedding, but he, he was killed. Now, you had to have a pretty good excuse to break your contract. Mm. And you needed £50. And £50 was a lot then. Mm. The MP for Macclesfield, where my mother lived, was a retired group captain. Got in touch with him, explained my brother had been killed, my brother was on her own, blah, blah, blah. They gave me OK to break my contract, provided I got the £50. Mm. So I went to Kathleen and said, have you got £50? <laughs> <laughs> And that's how I came out of the Air Force after ten and a quarter there, roughly, just over mm. ten, ten years, really. Mm. It held nothing for me. I didn't, I didn't know where I was going. No. So I came out on the Thursday. I went to this recruiting place for ex-servicemen. This man says, well, you have to start down there, you know, you don't think you're going up there? Start on Monday. So I started in this factory on the Monday. <laughs> Horrible little foreman. Oh, he was a, like a rug his neck. <laughs> anyway, I stuck it for four weeks. <laughs> then I rolled up my overalls and threw them away. Said, I've not, I'm, that's finished with that. Now what do I do? So I thought, oh, I like to be, see what about the selling business, you know. Advertising this firm, I think it was in Ilford. About 40 of us all went on a six week course. It was so vicious that at the end of it, there was only about 10 left, the rest cleared off quick. It was cold calling, selling carbon paper to offices in London. Oh, goodness. Real difficult job. They had offices throughout London and our office was just by Victoria Station and there were six of us there operating in different roads and they had the system such that they knew all the customers or possible customers and they had stacks of cards and each day you got another stack of cards, 40 in a stack, so you had to try and go in 40 calls up in these buildings. Just, mm. You got about 40 orders a day, 39 to get out, <laughs> one in the book. <laughs> yes. I thought, they're not gonna get, I'm not gonna let this get me down. I used to go and sit and read in, in, in the, the park by the, the palace there and say, well, what shall I do now? Well, I'm gonna stick this out a while. And I decided, well, why let all that training in the Air Force go to waste? Can I bring the two together? So that's what I set about doing. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, all right. You didn't have CVs in those days. You wrote off your own volition. I got this technical dictionary out of the library at Croydon. That was my local library. I thought, well, I'll open the... And, of course, AB, the first... 
happened to be a Brazier's. Eight names, right, start there. Borrowed a typewriter or hired one, mm -hmm. typed out eight letters and sent them off. Kathleen kept saying, come on, the dinner's ready, don't get away from that typewriter. <laughs> I said, just a minute, I'm nearly there. Sent them off, got no replies for six. One said, sorry, nothing available. And the eight said, maybe. So I wrote back, I said, well, I said, I just happened to be in Manchester next week. I'm in South London. <laughs> yes. I'll call in and see you. Well, that'll be all right. I called in at Truffle Park, an American company, cover on them. Yes, yes, there's a possibility. Uh, can't offer you anything direct. You'll have to be a clerk, answer the phone and learn something about the business. Right. Said to Kathleen, up the stakes were away to Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that's when we came up here and uh, did about 18 months, largely going around the factory. Our man in Scotland had, uh, in his spare time, been working for the BBC. Mm -hmm. He and his wife were Uncle Sam and Auntie somebody. That's where the children are. Oh, yes. <laughs> They'd been watching him for a while, so they gave him the heave-ho and said to me, do you want to go to Scotland? Oh, I said, all right, I'll go. Start. First of January. Christina was only six weeks old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Off we went. Most terrible winter it was. The snow was up here. So uh, I settled in in Scotland for nearly 20 years and represented them. Yes. And I came down and took over the earth, uh, sales force and then I changed, had a few different jobs and finished up travelling in Europe quite a lot, especially Paris. I used to go there often. And... Uh, you've, been, you've gone back up to Scotland? Came back down. Yes. Spent another 11 years at head office here. Yes. Was then made redundant. At 59, mm. I said to them, I said, you know, you'll regret this. <laughs> the firm folded three years later. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, Carberunham, based in Niagara Falls, had factories throughout the world. Yes. And they all shut. Do you remember all the heavy, big business, eh, eh, foundry, steel works, all yes. shut down? Heathrow, uh, is it Heath? But, uh, Heath you was mean... a prime example. They went through it here as well. Mm -hmm. If I'd stayed in Scotland, I wouldn't have had any customers to to call on. It all disappeared. Yes. So that was it. I was out again. What shall I do now? S some of the relatives on Kathleen's side. You want to put your feet up and have a rest for a while. You've done mm -hmm. enough. So I decided to be retired, put it that way. Yes. And that started my retirement, which has lasted nearly 36 years. It's a long retirement, isn't it? Mm. Mm. It, it? It is, it is. Have you regretted uh, that? Not one bit, <laughs> no. It's all passed just like that. Yes. Yes. There's always things to do, aren't there? That was the point. Uh, I was always working around, well, you know, Philip, don't you? <laughs> Trying to put crumbling bunkers together and one thing and another. Yes. The yes. time went on, yes. Is there anything that you felt that you experienced during the war that influenced your life afterwards? Oh, yeah, it sounds as though you were... Um, 
Probably to become more resolute. It's probably the... <laughs> yes. Which, um, of course, which became the driving force, in effect. Yes. Mm. D determination. Yeah. Mm. Yes. I mean, you've not had it easy if you've been made redundant once or twice uh, mm. or things have come to an end and you've had to f suddenly found yourself mm. having to to uh, f find uh, something else to do. Um, not easy when you have a, a family to uh, support and so on. Well, in that regard, of course, I didn't have a family because I had got this pretty good job with. Yes. Uh, well, Christina was uh, growing up in Glasgow. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. She was born in Manchester. Yes. Christened in Leeds, <laughs> educated in Scotland. <laughs> Well, that's not a bad very, uh, a combination, is it, really, on the whole? <laughs> One of our grandparents were Leeds, were Yorkshire, and the others were uh, Londoners, mm. yes. Is there... was, uh, I was saying, uh, my father, my grandmother on my father's side had seven children. Yes. My middle name is Fetz because she was a Miss Fetz before she married. Yes. And she married a Leslie, obviously. One of her brothers, David, David Fetz, was a very personal friend of the Queen's father, such that he made, her honor, made him honorary surgeon in 1936. Then he was given the OBE and then the CBE and became surgeon for the British Army. Mm -hmm. So we had fame on one side and fame <laughs> on the other side. Yes. Wonder how life works out, doesn't it? It it does indeed. Mm -hmm. It does indeed. If you talking about that, I mean, if you were asked to give advice to youngsters today about how to live a long and happy life, what would you say? I would say having the correct outlook on life. If you're gifted with it, well and good. If not, seek it out. Yes. Which is something you obviously did, mm. yes. And it will reward you in the end. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Alistair, I think we've probably come to an end at that point, but thank you very much indeed for welcome. allowing Wargen to come into your home <laughs> uh, uh, to, to listen to, to your memories. Thank you very much. You're welcome.